I'm here with Mark Gartner, who is a principal and head of business development at Clearlight Partners. And we're gonna start off with a really important question, which is, what is your spirit animal? <laughs> oh, I think I've always been captivated by the great white shark, to be honest. Um, you know, it's kind of terrifying in one sense, but probably the most impressive animal that I can think of in terms of what it does, so. Have you had a close encounter? <laughs> Thankfully, no. Uh, I think I aspire to do the cage diving in uh, South Africa if I ever have the opportunity to do that. But yeah, I both respect and uh, fear. All right. Great white shark. <laughs> um, cool. So let's, I have never gotten the story of Clearlight Partners. Let's go back to the 80s or 90s. But like, what is the story of Clearlight? Yeah, you know, every private equity fund has its own unique origin story. Um, you know, Clearlight is, is no different, although I do think it is pretty unique. We actually grew out of an operating company, and there's really not that many funds who can lay claim to that. And this really goes back to the 80s when our founder was running a residential security business called West Tech Security Group on behalf of a Japanese publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. And he had previously served uh, the Japanese entity as an attorney and based on good work and trust and respect that he'd earned from them and incidentally the ability to speak fluent Japanese despite growing up in Southern California which is obviously pretty impressive um, he was entrusted with the reins of this security business um, it was a turnaround situation when he got there it was about 35 million of revenue as as I understand it on the verge of losing money and he was able to grow it over a 15 year period to about a 250 million dollar business uh, before its ultimate exit and it was the exit of the West Tech business that generated about 300 million of proceeds. And our founder was entrusted with that capital to continue investing in US-based businesses uh, by the Japanese uh, parent company, which today is our single uh, limited partner. So chapter one was, you know, Michael Kay's turnaround of West Tech, sold it 300 million approximately the proceeds, and then he's deciding, okay, maybe I should start a fund. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. I think in the um, early days of you know having that capital, there yeah. was one idea to possibly buy a single business and continue running it uh, as he had run businesses previously. Uh, but ultimately that thinking evolved into forming a fund structure around that 300 million of proceeds. And so Clearlight's first fund was raised uh, officially in the year 2000 with you know our inaugural vehicle, if you will, of 300 million. So what was chapter two, like kind of the, the early days? Again, as I understand it, this predates me a bit. Yeah. There were some early venture stage investments that were made uh, out of Fund One, but the thinking changed to focus mostly on um, lower middle market, you know, private equity style deals. So established, profitable businesses with perhaps a little bit less of a, of a risk profile than venture stage investing. And, and that's what really the, the fund kind of evolved into. And so we ended up raising a second fund from the Japanese limited partner, uh, which is the same amount, another $300 million fund. When uh, was fund two? Uh, in 2007 yeah. is when we raised fund two. Continued on the strategy of, of focusing primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on uh, founder and family owned businesses operating within industries where we had a comfort level and saw good prospects for growth. So 2000, so that's kind of chapter two. And then where are we at today? Yeah, so we're currently investing from our third fund. Um, so yet another $300 million fund. And again, uh, every dollar we've invested to date has come from the Japanese limited partner. So they've been a wonderfully supportive uh, partner to us. Um, you know, we're probably two thirds of the way deployed with, with fund three. Yeah. Um, strategy is similar. I would say there are certain industries that have emerged as, you know, you could say specializations for us. We've been doing a lot in franchising lately, and that's been great to participate in a lot of um, very strong systems, whether that's uh, Planet Fitness or now Orange Theory, and we most recently bought an ice cream franchisor called Handles, so very exciting to be uh, on that side of the franchising world as well as a franchisor, and continue to look for good deals. What is the kind of the, the size and shape of the firm, aside from like Fund 3, 300 million, but how many people, et cetera? You know, give or take, we've always had about 15 or so investment professionals. Yeah. Um, I would say historically, if you go way back, maybe into chapter one or chapter two, to use your analogy, all of those investment professionals would have been on the core uh, deal execution or portfolio company governance side. But as the firm has evolved, and I think this really began back around 2007 when I joined the firm uh, as an associate, we started dedicating you know, very real resources behind a dedicated 
uh, deal origination function within the firm. And so now we've got two seats solely focused on deal sourcing and then maybe another 13 or so uh, professionals focused on deal execution. When did you start? Uh, 07. 07. So you've really seen this place grow and change over like 13 years and the not just like here but LA private equity and also the whole industry in itself for deal origination. I have this thesis that we're in kind of like BD version 3.0 and I could I probably am completely wrong but here's my thesis. BD version like 1.0 was where the partners and principals are doing their own sort sourcing BD version 2.0, I don't know when, maybe five years ago, maybe in the one or two vintages ago, is when BD kind of became like a real profession. And I think now it's like, okay, it's an established profession. Some funds have partner sourcing. A lot of funds have like dedicated BD and sourcing professionals. Um, I think the version 3.0 is now where people are asking themselves, okay, I go, I do the ACG circuit, I go to Opus, I do all this, I do my meetings, we're using a CRM, uh, maybe effectively, but version 3.0 I think is really characterized by uh, the need to leverage technology at scale with effective email blasts that are segmented with long form thought that's put onto your website, onto LinkedIn, uh, that's going out through email, just using digital technology, uh, digital media more often. What do you see the big difference is today for deal sourcing the past couple of years versus before? Your synopsis of the uh, evolution of deal sourcing is pretty good. You know, if you go back to the 80s or Would 90s- Would you say I'm full of shit if I was wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I might say it a little more planted than that, but, <laughs> Uh, if you go back to the 80s or 90s, I think the deal sourcing game in private equity could largely be relationship driven to a yeah. degree. Certainly there were investment banks, but you might not have had to have dedicated, you didn't have to have dedicated resources behind it because the competition isn't what it is today. You know, when I came to Clearlight in 07, our strategy, believe it or not, was largely focused on proprietary deal sourcing. And at that stage of the industry's evolution, you could still pick up the phone literally and call a business owner and initiate a discussion about uh, buying their business. And they weren't getting calls all the time from other private equity funds or bankers or lenders, what have you. And so you could get through. And I think over time, as the industry got a lot more competitive, that game got harder and harder to do because people just, there wasn't enough time in the day to field all the calls. And so what we then pivoted to was a more intelligent form of intermediary management. We realized all of a sudden, gosh, there's a lot of intermediaries that we don't know. We're not managing them in a technology-driven way through the use, say, of a CRM in the way that we could and, and should be doing and leveraging the data that comes out of that exercise. And so that produced some really interesting opportunities that we felt like we got you know, quasi-preferential access to or at least part of a, a more narrow um, set of potential buyers as a result of that dedicated focus on, on intermediaries. Well, I think other funds kind of got wise to how that worked. And so you started seeing a lot more bodies showing up at the ACG conferences yeah. and uh, other intermediaries, you know, telling you, gosh, this is like the fifth call I've gotten today, you know? And so you realize there's really nothing differentiated about the strategy anymore. So you have to pivot to what's next. And you touched on something that's really important, which is it's technology to a degree. And I think <clears throat> it might even be proprietary deal origination 2.0 or 3.0, you know, whatever the evolution is that we are in right now, um, in the sense that I think maybe the game is getting a hold of the business owner directly in a more intelligent way than we used to. And you're absolutely right, technology is at the core of that. Do you think that conferences are a good use of time? And to what extent? I don't think you need to go to every conference that exists. I think perhaps new BD professionals, if they're looking to get themselves out there and develop relationships, the conference circuit can be a wonderful way to immerse yourself in the industry and you know get in a room with all of the right people. Um, I think once you are frankly friends with a lot of these people, yeah. you might not have to go to the same conferences because they're gonna take your calls and that's, that's good enough. Um, obviously, I don't mean to diminish the value of in-person interactions, that's huge, but you don't have to go to every single conference. So I think, um, the name of the game now is being much more strategic about where you fly and when because it chews up a lot of time and, and resources. And the CRM can actually be an interesting tool that illuminates, geographically speaking, where do you need to go and where do you not need to go. And we really try to do that to make best use of our When you were kind of getting into more social media and blogging, updating the website, uh, I think you're a 
tell me about like your first blog. What was that experience like? Yeah, any first time experience can be kind of scary, to be honest, and like funds, for whatever reason, are somewhat reticent to put out content. And when we first put it up there, it's like, you don't really know what's gonna happen. And so, you know, we put up a pretty simplistic blog in hindsight, I kind of laugh when I read it now, and it's like, you just kind of wait, you know, for something to happen. And, and honestly, nothing, not much happened. We weren't distributing it, especially widely. I don't think we even put it on LinkedIn. It was kind of just residing on our website. And we're kind of like, now what? And I think what was important was taking that first step to have the, the courage to kind of put your thoughts down in writing and get it out there. And then from there- Because it shifted your mentality. Totally. Of, okay, I'm done with this. It's not that hard. I'll start producing more content. It's that absolute to a degree. And it's also like, we're not in the game of hoarding information anymore. It's sharing information. And so we got a little bit more courageous and sophisticated about how we disseminate that stuff. And, you know, I think now we, we've kind of evolved into, I'll call it an audience driven strategy where we're not going for virality with our blogs. I don't need a thousand likes to feel good about something that I put on LinkedIn. I just need the right people to see it like it and then take action. You know, my definition of success is if I'm getting contacted by a business owner in a sector that we like, who saw a piece of content and found it through a search engine uh, or on LinkedIn. That, that's how I get excited. It's interesting because the metrics on LinkedIn, for example, are so, they're difficult to have attribution. So you could have a post that you put a lot of thought into that's quality and it gets 25 or 10 reactions. Right. And then the next week you're in a meeting with somebody and you're like, yeah, I saw your post. Like, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, but that's, it goes back to, I think the need to be consistent, to be diverse with how you message and just stay focused on being authentic value added in your content. And to your point, like being a resource, did you make that point? Or maybe I'm just saying it a different way. Well, I, I did. Um, I basically talked about sharing information. Sharing information. It. That's, and yeah. that's, I guess if you're, especially if you're focused on founders, you know, this might be the first real big transaction that they've gone through, you know, perceiving the capital provider and, f and future partner as someone who is like really trying to make their life better, not just through money and a, and a change of control or minority investment, what it is, but like just trying to be a genuine resource to them. Right. It's interesting. Like I like, I really like that phraseology of like not sharing, not hoarding. <laughs> like when you look back on your 13 years here, what are some of the, like, the defining moments? Or if there has been one, um, or if it's more like, you know, just every single year getting better. Like what do you, when you look back on the past 13 years, what are some of your, your favorite times here, either with the team or with the portfolio? It's a good question. Um, when you say 13 years and I really reflect on that, it really sounds like a long time. <laughs> and I have to laugh when I think about some of the perspectives or things that I did when I was a junior professional and the yeah. mistakes I made along the way and yeah. kind of where I am now. So it's it's really been a fulfilling journey to enhancing my skill set and, and really adapting to a lot of change within our industry. Um, goes without saying, when you get a deal sourced and closed and get to put some points on the board, that feels really, really good because you know you've um, done what you're here to do and it, it really makes a big impact on the firm. And it's not just me, there's been people that have been on you know my business development team that have sourced and closed really successful deals. Uh, and that's really gone a long way for their careers. And, and that's been really important for me to see too. So, you know, most of my perspectives are gonna be through the lens of business development because that's what I've spent most of my time um, doing. But it's been a really rewarding place to, to make a career. And to your prior point, it wasn't always a place that had career potential. But as the position has uh, evolved and become more, you know, professionalized, sophisticated within the industry, it's very much kind of a career track and uh, career track position, so. Where do you see private equity going in the next three to five years? Not from a dry powder perspective, or but maybe more structural elements. For example, we're gonna be seeing a lot more small funds staying and staying small, or we're gonna see private equity doing more multi-strategy and just the $10 billion funds. Like, what, what is your opinion on it? You made the point about uh, funds focused on smaller deals. I think there still remains a lot of opportunity in the smaller end of the lower middle market. You know, we've seen our tolerance for smaller deals increase over time because that's where there's opportunity. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that. You know, I think a lot of funds have resisted specialization to a degree. You know, our origins are as a generalist and we get up to speed very quickly on sectors we may or may not have prior expertise in. But I will say, you know, where we're seeing a lot of wins uh, is by leveraging you know, prior investments 
uh, for the firm and you know kind of resting on some of those case studies to, to get us into new investment opportunities. So I mentioned franchising. I would totally expect to see that become an increasing uh, focus you know for the firm. And so other funds are going to have to leverage their wins and their history to position themselves as the best buyer. It's not the case that you can kind of wander into an auction process anymore and kind of do your best and, and try to prevail. Someone who has expertise and battle scars is going to have uh, more conviction than you, uh, particularly to pay the prices that are, you know, happening in the market right now. It's an expensive uh, market. It's a good time to be a seller. I think a lot of people are going to be um, evolving into what it takes to win, and like it or not, that it's probably going to be more specialization. That's really good. I think I, I kind of stepping back from this whole episode here, like I. I Really, some of my key takeaways are like the need to specialize, the need to differentiate yourself in terms of how you're reaching out to not just sellers, but like the whole market. Um, and also like I love the story on the firm. I've never, I've always known the Clearlight name. I've been in the industry for 10 years, but I've never actually known the story. Is there anything we haven't talked about? I think, you know, in the spirit of finding differentiation, um, what I love about our firm is that a lot of the folks here, uh, particularly amongst the most senior leadership, have um, had operating roles before. You know, every fund has its own unique pedigree. Some folks come from investment banking. That was originally my background or management consulting. Um, but we got a lot of guys here who knows who know what it means to have P&L responsibility. Yeah. And in some cases, even start companies as entrepreneurs or be private equity backed executives. And I think uh, in, I don't know, uh, connecting with the business owner, it goes such a long way when business owners can view you as having similar experiences, which isn't always the case if a business owner is looking at a fund, um, you know, inhabited by mostly you know financial professionals who haven't executed strategy before. And so I really think that's a, another great differentiation for Clearlight. That's awesome. All right. Anything else? Uh, you touched on content. Okay, can I, can yeah. I, yeah. You touched on content going, and you talked about... Um, our content strategy and connecting with business owners to be a resource. You know, if I was a business owner, I would be naturally skeptical of anything on someone's website. Cause like, how am I being marketed to essentially, or how am I being told a story that's convenient for them and not necessarily for me? We've deliberately developed a content strategy to make private equity and investing approachable uh, to the business owner and written in plain English. So there's, there's nothing hidden. We're not hiding behind uh, finance jargon. We're not trying to confuse anybody. It's, Step by step, here's what you need to know about going through a transaction process and what to expect along the way, for instance, or how to maximize the value of your business, or why private equity funds like investing in founder or family-owned businesses. It's really kind of a how-to guide that we're creating in, in the hope you know, the, the big, hairy, audacious goal is that we become a destination of choice for business owners exploring a sale transaction. And we're you know, trying to take steps to make that happen. That's really cool. The, the fact that you're saying the words content strategy in the private equity industry is very unique. And it's super cool to see, uh, you know, just kind of you thinking about that and just wild frontier, not too wild, somewhat. Is there anything individual from like your personal story? I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, very much a Midwestern background uh, and lived there my entire life through the end of high school. Uh, I think deep down I always wanted to be a basketball player, but didn't have the... Uh, athletic chops to do that competitively or professionally. Uh, and so I got to live vicariously through the Duke Blue Devils who uh, great liberal arts education, major in econ, minor in Spanish, joined a fraternity, traveled abroad, did, you know, had a really great experience in undergrad. And I think I got caught up in uh, the desire for folks to join uh, the financial industry. And so the uh, aspirational job at the time was investment banking. Uh, I took a position with a boutique out of Memphis, Tennessee called Morgan Keegan, mm -hmm. uh, which not too long ago got acquired by Raymond James. Um, but that was my exposure to the M&A process and I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, initially, I was working on, I guess, mostly industrials deals and transportation logistics transactions and was um, had the opportunity to join Houlihan Loki's industrials group out of LA uh, as part of their plastics and packaging team. And then uh, at the end of my analyst tenure, I was looking for a buy side job, which again is a somewhat common track, you know, for folks in finance. And I interviewed with a lot of firms, uh, but ultimately settled on Clearlight because they're building out this sort of new quasi experimental private equity deal origination engine. And this is back in 2007. And so I was given the opportunity to effectively eat what I killed. So I got yeah. to source and execute to the extent I brought something in. And that was very compelling to me at that stage of my career. 
and uh, had a wonderful experience both uh, on the, the topmost end of the funnel, sourcing a deal from a phone call uh, to working on a transaction and then being involved with the portfolio companies post-closing. And so to me, I couldn't have asked for a better experience along the way. I think ultimately, everybody's got to do the soul searching about what do they really want to do and what are they the best at. And my natural, or, natural orientation was on deal sourcing. And so I ultimately kind of made a, uh, a career decision, a pivot, if you will, to go uh, um, exclusively into deal origination. And so I've kind of, you know, ridden the wave of, of the specialization of that role within private equity, which has been scary at times, but also very exciting. Um, and I'm just happy to say that, you know, I've been doing it now for, as you pointed out, 13 years, and I'm in a really, you know, good home, a really good platform to, uh, to help Clearlight stay ahead of the curve of changes in deal origination. It's awesome. Appreciate you telling the story. Yeah.